hundred days now. Um, this morning I want to talk a little bit about my dad. And uh, many of you know my dad died uh, a little over a year ago, but I, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk to uh, about the time that I went to my dad to tell him about what I was going to be through in college. Um, so most of you know that before going to seminary, I was a public school music teacher. I taught junior high and high school band and choir. And I remember uh, having a discussion with my mom, uh, who I always got along better with than my dad, and I'm telling her that this was my plan, that I was going to be a, a music major in college. And my mom couldn't have been any more excited to hear this news. Uh, neither of my parents were particularly, particularly musical, except for my mom playing the accordion. Um, but it wasn't the best accordion player or whatever, but she, she really always appreciated going to the musical events that I was in and could see that I had some talent in, in that area, so she was very much in support of me becoming a music teacher. And then she told me, well, you should go tell your dad that. And I was like, oh crap, this is not going to go well. See, I, my dad was one of these men men's men's, you know, these kind of guys who can build anything out of a two by four, who seems to, who was able to kind of fix any engine or anything that came in front of him. He was this guy who was just big and burly and tough, um, whose main goal in life was to get as much as he could get done, done all the time. And I wasn't. I remember going up to my dad, he was sitting in our living room, he was sitting in a leather recliner underneath the ceiling fan, because it was kind of warm. I get that trick from my dad, I like to be cool, and I went up to my dad, and I was like, Dad, you know, I finally decided what I want to major in in college, and he was like, oh yeah, really, what, what is that? I'm like, music. And he was like, so what are you going to do? Well, Dad, you know, I'm going to learn about music theory and study and do all this stuff. And he was like, but what are you going to do? What are you going to produce? I'm like, well, you know, Dad, I'll spend time in the, in the music practice room, and I'll practice my French horn, and I'm going to get really good, and then maybe I'll, I'll go teach. And he's like, but what are you going to produce? You see, my dad had this idea that to be a, a productive member of society, you, you had to produce something. Whether that was uh, fixing something, or building something, or anything like that, that it was my job in the world to produce. And he couldn't see that studying music, or being a music teacher, was going to produce anything. And I was thinking about this conversation earlier this week, when I when I was reflecting on what I do on a daily basis. Because I have friends who, who know me as Dan, who we hang out, but don't know me as Pastor Dan. And an a interesting conversation topic with them is, well, what do you do all the And I say, well, you know, I, I study scripture, I prepare for sermons, I think about what we're called to do as, as people of faith in the community. I pay attention to the news and I try to make a sense of how God is operating in the world. And their questions are always, well, that's great. What do you do 39 other hours during the course of the day? <laughs> what are you producing? And you see, I think in, in uh, the United States, um, and in particular, kind of in the Midwest, we have this idea of production or that, that we find our worth in the things that we're able to produce, right? Whether we're working in a factory or working on a farm or doing this or doing that, like our identity is in what we produce for the world. And I have one of these occupations where I don't produce an awful lot of tangible things that you can pick up and manipulate with your hands or put in your mouth to chew and eat and digest and get nourishment, all my production happens internally. Therefore, it's hard sometimes to quantify how I've spent my time doing my work because it's not 
visible what I'm producing. And sometimes in the midst of these conversations with my friends, when, when they talk about the things that they've done in their work, and things that they produce, I start comparing their work to my work. And I start feeling like I'm not as valuable as they are. Because people use the things that they do, or eat the things that they grow. I hope and pray people think about the things they think about. But I really can't quantify it. And I wonder how many other people in the world find value, their value, in the things that they produce, rather than just being the person that they are. And that's what I think today's scripture lesson is about. Uh, this lesson, this interaction with Mary and Martha and Jesus. See, this is about halfway in the Gospel of Luke, and this is the first interaction that, 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 that where, where Jesus goes to Mary and Martha's house. And Jesus shows up, and we assume that they're going to eat dinner or whatever, he's going to go visit. And Martha does what is expected of her. She starts to produce Right? Whether that's cleaning the house, or making the food, or doing all this stuff, Martha's life is filled with these tasks. Because these tasks are what are expected of her, because these tasks are the things that society has deemed that make deemed to make Martha valuable in the eyes of society, right? Now Mary comes in and Mary doesn't do anything. She kind of stands in, well, she kneels in opposition to what the society says that she should be doing, and instead dwells with Jesus. And we get this interaction with Martha and Jesus, where Martha goes to Jesus and not unexpectedly says, God, what's going on? Jesus, what's going on? Tell her to work with Tell her that we have lots of things to produce, and she should be about this production. Now, we don't know for sure if Mary is just tired and needs a healthy hand, or if Mary is seeing what Martha is doing and saying in her mind, well, she's proving that she's in, she's not of any value because she's not outputting anything. But we do know that Martha kind of calls Mary out, and then Jesus calls Martha out. And he says, Oh Martha, Martha. I assume, oh Martha, Martha, from the brain. I'm trying to be honest about that. But oh Martha and Martha, don't you understand that Mary has chosen the better part? And I am not going to take this better part away from now, there's lots of questions about what this better part might be, right? Because there's not a lot of explanation in Scripture what it might be. Although, we could assume that the better part is the fact that Mary is spending time in relationship with Jesus and not getting distracted by the tasks around her. But it could also be that Mary is, is understanding that the value is not in the things that she produces, but her value is that she's a child of God, therefore a child of Jesus. So why shouldn't she be spending time abiding with her God and finding value in that? You see, later on in Scripture, Jesus comes back to Mary and Martha. He comes back when their brother dies, and there's a proclamation of, if you were here, Jesus, my brother would not have died. And Jesus performs this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And then there's a recognition of the power of God. But what if Mary recognized that power of God here in today's story instead? And says, this is what is valuable to me. This is how I value my life, marked as a child of God. Now, we can fall into a danger zone if we read this passage 
in this way because it seems like almost Jesus is 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 banishing her or or telling Martha that she's silly or or or, or dumb because she's trying to produce things in the world. And if we go down this thought spiral, we can get to a place where we can say, well, as Christians, we don't have to produce anything. We found our identity as child, children of God, and that's how we're valued in this world. And I, and I don't necessarily agree with that. I think we're called to do actions, and we're called to produce. But we're called to produce not for the sake of ourselves, we're called to produce for the sake of God and God. Right? Luther would argue that as well with his understanding of vocation that God blesses us to do things that, that propagates God's message of love and forgiveness in the world, and we should be about doing those things. But maybe we should also be wary of the sin of, of comparison where we put the things that we do in a higher priority in our lives than the person that we're made to be. Right? Or our identity as, as children of God. Maybe, maybe what this passage is all about is, is, is Jesus saying to Martha, you're not valuable to me because you can fold the laundry or cook a good brisket. You're valuable to me because I love you. Because of who you are and what that means. Not the widget. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I guess what I'm saying today is that we should be people um, of a balance. We should be people who seek balance in our lives, who recognize that there is indeed a call to work, but we shouldn't define ourselves by the work that we do. Instead, we should define ourselves by the fact that we are loved by God and children of God. That it is okay sit and pray and spend time with God instead of maybe doing the dishes. But that's not a waste of time or energy or skill. Let us be people who don't find our worth in what we do, but who we are. Love children of God. Let us abide with Jesus, live there for a while, so that we can then go out in the world to do God's work. Thanks be to God.